Okay, from lecture four, uh, we're officially into the realm of statistics. And uh, this first lecture, I'm going to introduce some very fundamental descriptive statistics. And uh, you need to know that um, the statistics, they're not exclusive to uh, geography, okay? They can be commonly used in different disciplines. And for uh, most content of this class, uh, it, it it can be applied in different disciplines, okay? And of course, I'm going to, we're going to discuss some content uh, with, of course, statistical content with uh, geospatial context, but um, you should know that most content here in this class uh, is not exclusive to geography, okay? Let's get started. So, um, there are, descriptive statistics for different purposes, okay? Some of them, they are for measures of central tendency, uh, center or typical value of a data set, such as mean, median, and mode. Some statistics, they are for measures of variability. Um, they are used to describe the extent of spread or uh, variability of your data set. For example, the range of your data set, variance, standard deviation of your data set. Uh, the rest, they focus on the shape or relative position of your data set. Of course, when we're talking about shape, there must be uh, a figure or a chart or, um, or a curve, right? Um, so for example, uh, these statistics, they can be used to address the same, um, symmetry of your data set, um, the distri uh, distribution of your data, of your observations, flatness or uh, pickedness of your data set. Of course, in order to address uh, symmetry, flatness or pickedness, you have to uh, draw curves uh, to visualize your data set, okay? For example, uh, skewness, uh, ketosis, they are matters of uh, shape of your data set, okay? I'm going to introduce them one by one in this lecture. Uh, first, let's talk about mean. Mean is the most commonly used statistic for central tendency of your data sets. Um, average of all observations, uh, the sum of all observed values divided by the number of observations. Okay, so uh, we have sample mean and population mean. So before introducing mean, I want to differentiate two concepts. One is sample, another one is population. Popul population is, uh, in statistics, population is the pool, the whole pool from which your samples can be drawn from. For example, uh, there is a big city with one million population. Um, you want to um, carry out a survey to address the average commuting time. Let's just use this e example again. Uh, to, survey the average, uh, to, to survey the commuting time of young people within this city. Okay, so um, you cannot survey this one million people is one million population, right? So you have to draw some samples. If you consider each sample as an individual, sure. Sometimes we can, uh, we can also define sample as a group of observation, of observations you drawn from the population. For example, here, uh, the population of this uh, statistical research is the whole population of the city, okay? When we're talking about population of the city, it means uh, the number of people who live in this city. But in statistics, when we're talking about population, it means that uh, the whole pool of your study, okay? Obviously, in this example, the whole pool is one million people. And uh, uh, you want a sample from this population, say 1,000 people. This 1,000 people is the sample of the population, okay? Sometimes uh, you could do sub-experiments sub from your uh, larger experiment. For example, uh, you surveyed this 1,000 people 
And then you want to draw even a smaller sample from this 1,000 people to do another research based on this huge survey of 1,000 people. If that is the case, you can also consider this 1,000 people as the population because this time, this 1,000 people is the whole pool of your research. And uh, I'll say you want to draw 100 people from this population to do another uh, sub-research, sub-experiment, then that 100 people again is sample. So you can see here the definition of sample and population is relative, but population is always the whole pool of your statistic, statistical, statistical uh, research. If you're talking about uh, a city, then the whole population of the city is the population of your study. Right, you do a research, uh, you, you drew 1,000 people. That 1,000 people in this scenario is sample. But if you do even more research based on this 1,000 people, then this 1,000 people can be the population of your next research. Then you draw 100 people from this 1,000 people, then it's 100 people again is sample. Okay, so sample and population, you always want to figure out what you are dealing with right now. Is it sample, is it population? Because the formulas you are going to use could be different depending on your dealing, depending on uh, the, the, the object. Are you dealing with a sample or are you dealing with the whole population? So for me, there is no difference between them, between sample mean and population mean. So sample mean usually is addressed by X bar. So you add up all observations, right? And divide that sum by the number of observations in your sample, which is addressed by lowercase n. For population, we use different letters, but the idea here is the same. So population mean is a usually uh, addressed by this Greek letter mu. Um, so uh, the, the, the numerator is the sum of, of course, all observations in your population. Okay, if the city has 1 million people, then you should add up uh, the commuting time, commuting time of 1 million people. In real world, uh, in an actual research, it's not possible, but this is just the definition, okay? so. XI here is used to address each individual in your population instead of sample, okay? And the denominator is uppercase N, which means um, the total number of observations in your population pool, okay? So uh, the idea here is the same. We just use different um, letters and um, um, different formulas, right? Two formulas, X bar, uh, mu, lowercase and uppercase n, but mean is just mean, okay? So next, let's talk about something called grouped mean or weighted mean. So when data are available only for categories, grouped means can be calculated, okay? One, be careful here. When you're trying to calculate grouped mean, it means that your data must be in categories. Grouped means are achieved by assuming that all the data within a particular category take on the midpoint value of the category. Midpoint, for example, um, example later, okay? Uh, here is the formula for, for grouped mean. So uh, we have XG, G for group, XG is a uh, grouped mean. So uppercase G, is the number of groups, right? We have uppercase G here, uppercase G here. X I need is the midpoint value of the ith group. So there are multiple groups. And for each group, you can always find a mid value. I'll show you how to do that later. So F I is the weight of the ith group. So we have F I here. So um, for denominator, you have to calculate the sum of weights for all groups. For a uh, numerator, you have to use each group's weight to multiplicate that group's 
need value and uh, eventually you add all groups up okay here is an example so we have uh this very simple table with two columns first column for the income a uh, second column for the frequency specifically number of individuals in each group so for this first group uh the income is uh, lower than fifteen thousand. Ten people are in this group similarly we have group two group three group group four and the number of people within each group they're all listed here okay so we have group data four groups right and uh, how to calculate the so-called grouped mean here is the formula here right on the right side let's just talk about each input here okay so let's talk about fi first fi is the weight for each group usually we simply use the frequency of each group as its weight so for group one the weight is 10 the group two the weight is 20 for group three the weight is 30 then 15. so for denominator it's pretty straightforward 10 plus 20 plus 30 plus 15. okay so for numerator for each group we need to use its weight to multiplicate its mean value so for group one the weight is 10. mean value is 7500 it is the mean value between 0 and 15,000 because your income cannot be negative can be zero which is very sad but <laughs> the mean value between 0 and 15,000 is 7500 so we use it use the first group's mean value multiply its weight which is 10 to get the first term of this um, of this numerator okay and then similarly 20 is the weight for the second group and uh, 25,000 is the mean value between 15,000 and uh, 34,999 mean value right so we do this repeatedly for the third group for the fourth group and uh, together together we add them up we, eat, we we add all these terms up we have the numerator right and eventually you use um uh, the sum of weight to, to divide uh, the numerator you get the grouped mean for these four groups so 41167 okay so this is the idea of grouped mean you can say that in order to use it you must have grouped data sets right um, group one group two group three group four of course you can have even more groups but the idea stays the same okay next one another statistic for central tendency is called median okay we introduced the average um now we talk about median it is the middle value on the set of ranked observation, which means you have to rank all your observations first. Ascending, descending, doesn't matter, okay? The value with an equal number of observations below it or above it. Remember, it's not mid value. Mid value is the mathematical mid value decided by the lower and upper um, boundaries of your data range right for example twenty five thousand is the mean value of fifteen thousand and thirty four thousand nine hundred and ninety nine it is calculated by the average value of uh, sorry by uh, uh, it is calculated by finding out the actual midpoint of these two boundaries. Okay, you, of course, you can just um, uh, add them up and uh, divide them by two, right? Divide them by two to find this mid value. But in your observation, this mid value does not necessarily be there it is not necessarily an observed value which means that there are 20 people 
in this group, in group two, right? 25,000 is the mean value of this group, but it doesn't mean that, doesn't necessarily mean that one of this, uh, one or several of these individuals have a specific income of 25,000, okay? It's just the result of mathematical calculation. But median is different. You have to actually rank all those observed data and find that value in the middle of your, of your ranking, okay? For example, um, median middle value right so we have one two three four five five observations we rank them from um say uh, ascending we rank them ascending from the smallest value 38 to the largest value 62 because now we have uh odd we have an odd number of observations one, two, three, four, five. We have five observations. So it's easy to find the middle value, which is 48, which is 48. Remember here, 48 is not something you calculated. It's the value of an actual observation in your ranking system, in this small ranking system, right? From 38 to 44, to 48, to 55, to 62. So what if the number of observations is even? So median can be calculated as the average of two middle values. So here, for example, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six observations. There is no actual um, middle value because we have three values uh, for the first half and uh, three other values for the second half of your data set, you cannot actually find out an observation to, 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 to address the median value. So here we have to do calculation. We calculate the average value of 48 and 50. They are in the center of this ranking, right? So we get a num value of 49. This time, this 49 is not something you observed. It's not a value from, a, from a, an observation. It's something you calculated. You had to do this because we have um, even observations, even number of observations. There is no actual middle value. So that's what you do to calculate, to find out media. And the mode. Mode is the third central tendency statistic I want to introduce. The value that appears most often in a data set. Okay. Okay, for, for, for nominal ordinal data, we just use this table again as, as what? As an example. So the most frequent, frequently occurring value for interval and ratio data it's relatively easy to find out. For example, 20, 35, 10, 20, 60, 12. So 20 appeared two times. So 20 is the mode of this data set. Let's get back to this uh, nomin nominal ordinal data or group data again. What is the mode of this table, of this whole data set with four groups? Obviously, what is group three, okay? That category, the category with greatest frequency is the mode of your data set because 30 people, 30 individuals, they belong to group three. So group three is considered as the mode or category three, right? From 35,000 to 54, 1999 this group this category is the mode of your data set okay because it has uh, a greatest frequency okay let's continue um yeah here is uh, the result right for the uh, for the mode of this um interval or ratio data set uh the one appears uh, the most the most frequently occurring value is the mode, which is 20 for this specific example. Okay, what's next? So 20, 35, 10, 20, 60, 60. 
we have two 20s, we have two 60s. So you have two modes because 20 and 60, they both appear twice. So um, <clears throat> validity to measurement scale, like I mentioned in a previous lecture, uh, there is a hierarchy system for different uh, types of data from nominal data to ordinal data to interval data to ratio data. Some calculations can be done with some of them, but not all of them. For example, calculating mean and median for nominal data is meaningless. You don't do that, right? But you can, of course, calculate mode or find out mode for nominal data because mode is uh, the, the value that appears mostly, most frequently occurring name or data, right? For ordinal, for interval, for ratio, um, for all you know, mean is still meaningless, right? But you can always find median and mode for all you know data. For interval and ratio data, you can do all the calculations to them. You can calculate all the statistics um, for them, for them. Yeah? Which matter to use, okay? For nominal, you have no choice, right? Uh, in order to, to, to address the central tendency, you can only use mode. For ordinal data, median is better. Uh, for, for interval and ratio data, um, if this data set is normally distributed, uh, we'll talk about normal distribution later in this class, but um, let's just, for now just remember this. If there is no skewness, right, the curve of your data set or the histogram of your data set is not skewed to one direction right or left, then mean is good to use uh, to address the central tendency of a data set. If your data is skewed, a uh, median is better. Uh, what is a skewed data set? I will show you later in this lecture. And I will tell you why median is better than mean when your data set uh, is skewed, when the histogram of a data set is skewed. Okay. Um, more statistics here. Range, uh, the difference between the maximum and the minimum values. It's sensitive to outliers. Outlier is, you can consider outliers as special one, special observations that are very different from um, the mainstream of your data set. For example, uh, 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 in an experiment, uh, most observations you got have a value very close to 20. But suddenly there are some very special observations. They have values around 2,000, but very limited numbers. Say uh, in 1,000 observations, there were two special observations have uh, values of uh, 2,000 and 2,001. But the rest observations, they only have a value around 20. So these two outliers with values of 2000 and 2001, they are very special. They are outliers compared to the mainstream of your data set, right? If you have outliers, they will affect your range because these outliers, they have extremely high value compared to the mainstream or extremely low values compared to the to, to, to the mainstream, to the, to the majority of your data set. When you calculate range, you always want to find out max value and mean value. If there are outliers, um, your range can be seriously, dramatically affected. Next one is called quantile. The P's quantile is the value such that proportion P of the data points or observations are less than or equal to it, and the proportion one minus p of the observations are greater than or equal to it. For four quantiles, we have another name, it's called quartiles. For 100 quantiles, we have another name, it's called percentile. Okay, in order to find out quantile, you have to rank your observations first. 
Okay, that's always uh, something you want to do before finding out quantile. Okay, and there is another definition. There is another type of range. It's called interquartile range. It's a difference between 25th and the 75th percentiles. Let me show you some a, a figure to show you the idea of um, different um, quantiles. So you rank the data and just say after after the ranking, you divide the whole data set into four divisions. Each one accounts for what? 25% of your observations, right? So let's just say uh, on the left side, we have the mean value. On the right side, we have the max value of your data set. So from left to right, um, you can expect that your um, observation values will increase one by one, right? So the boundary between the first 25% and the second 25% of your data set is what is called the first quartile or lower quartile or Q1. Median is actually the center of your data set after ranking, of course. It, it can be considered as the second quartile because it is the boundary between the second of 25% and the third 27%. 25%, right? Or mid quartile or Q2, but median is the most commonly used name for this specific uh, position or that observation or that uh, position here in the middle. And similarly, uh, we can find the third quartile of your data set. Okay. And the interquartile range is the difference between Q3 and Q1. Okay, okay. So for example, we have a data set like this. Okay, uh, obviously they have not been ranked these observations. Let me rank them uh, ascendingly. Like uh, from five to seven to 12, um, increase, 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 and uh, eventually you have 53. So the ranking has been done, okay? So how many observations are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. Okay, 12 is the first quartile because it is the boundary between the first 25% and the second 25%. And 22 similarly is the second quartile or the median of your data set. On the left side of 22, we have one, two, three, four, five, five observations. On the right side of 22, we have one, two, three, four, five, five observations. It is conveniently the center of your ranking for this data set. Why is it convenient? Because we have 11 observations, which is an odd number. Good, we don't have to calculate to find out the median. Median is 22. So similarly, we can find out the third quartile of this specific data set, which is 36. Now, what is the interquartile range of this data set? Q3 minus Q1, which means 36 minus 12. The result is 24. So 24 is the interquartile range of this data set. Okay, I hope this figure and this example here can make this idea of quantile very clear. Okay, what is a first quartile? What is medium? What is third quartile? What is interquartile range? Okay, if you cannot memorize them, we well, need to use this uh, concepts, get back to this slide for information. Okay. Okay, uh, next deviation to mean. It is the statistic to address variability of your data set. Okay, the first one I want to introduce is called variance. And in order to calculate variance, we have to calculate the deviation to mean first. Let's just use the I 
to represent the deviation of observation i to the mean. So the idea here is very clear. You simply calculate uh, that specific the difference between a specific observation and the mean of your data set. This is the difference. It's literally the deviation of that specific observation from the mean or say to the mean. Okay, so it is addressed by DI. So if we do this for all observations in your data set and we, 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 we calculate the sum of deviation, the deviation could be negative, could be pos positive, right? For example, X bar equals five, a specific um, observation is six, then the deviation is one. What if that observation is three? Three minus five equals negative two, right? So the deviation is negative two. So it's possible that eventually uh, uh, the sum of deviation is zero. Sum of all deviations to mean is zero. I just want you to know that it is possible, okay? So in order to avoid this scenario, because we want to address um, the, uh, the variability of your data set, if all those observations, they are clustered and they are close to each other in terms of their values, or they are spreading out, okay, they are very low values, they are very high values, uh, there, uh, there are a lot of observations far away from the mean. It means that the var variability of a data set is very huge. But if, if there is positive value and negative value, uh, it's not convenient to address that. So before we add, before add, we adding all the deviations up, we calculate the square of each deviation and then add them up. So we always have a positive value. Okay, so eventually we develop something um, called variance. So we calculate the difference between each observation and uh, the mean and square the, re the result, square the difference to make sure it's positive and add them up. We do this for each observation and eventually we add them up and divide that sum by n minus one in which n, uh, I mean, n represents what? the number of observations, right? So um, after this calculation, we define, we give it a name to the result of this ratio calculation is called variance. And it is addressed by S square, S square, okay? So if S square is very large, it means that um, the observations of this data set is spreading out from the mean, okay? There are low values, there are high values, there are uh, a lot of other observations. Some of them, they are very close to the mean there. Some of them, they are very far away from the mean. But if the S value, S square or variance is very large, it means that um, this data set is spreading out. If the, uh, if the variance is very low, it means that most values, most observations in your data set, they are very close to your mean, to the mean of the data set, okay? So variance is used to address the variability of your data set. But variance sometimes is not convenient because it's S squared. It means that the scale of your result will be different from your original data set. For example, if uh, this data set is above temperature, air temperature, eventually you calculate the variance of, uh, of your data set uh, for temperature, the va variance unit or scale will be squared Celsius degree or squared uh, Fahrenheit, which is different from its original unit, which could be simply Celsius degree or Fahrenheit degree. This is very convenient in application. So let's just do this. 
we calculate the square root of variance. This time it's not as square, it's simply as. On the right side of the formula, we simply calculate the square root of uh, the variance. So eventually, um, for standard deviation of your temperature data set, it's still with the unit of Celsius degree or Fahrenheit, which is consistent with your original data set. So variance has been defined, but it's not widely used. Usually we use the square root of variance, which is called standard deviation to address variability of data sets. Okay, variance has different scale or unit from the mean and the original data, which is something we do not want. Standard deviation has a closer scale to the mean and the original data. Okay, the unit of a standard deviation is always consistent with the original data. Okay, so here is an example. Okay, so we have two data sets, right? A, this is data set A, this is data set B. Uh, in order to calculate standard deviation, of course, you have to calculate X A bar, X B bar, which are what? Means for data set A and B, right? Uh, conveniently, of course, I designed these two data sets to show you the difference of standard deviation, okay, with the same central tendency. You can say that X bar A is zero, X bar B is also zero, which means that if you are using average value or mean value to address the central tendency of these two data sets, they are the same. They have the same mean value, which is zero. But how about standard deviation? Let me ask you, data set A, minus three, two, one, zero. Positive one, two, three. Data B, zero, minus 10, minus 20, minus 30. Positive 10, positive 20, positive 30. Which one has a larger variability? Of course, data B, uh, I mean, data set B, because there are smaller values, there are larger values, right? They are, they, they're away from the mean, which is zero. For data set A, the mean is still zero, but these observations, other observations, they are closer to the mean. So B, according to the definition of variability, has higher variability. Let's just check if standard deviation can prove, can prove that. Okay, so standard deviation of A, this is how you calculate it. Okay, so um, you use each observation to minus the mean, which is zero, and you calculate the square of that, add them up, and divide that value by n, which is seven minus one. So standard deviation of A is 2.16. How about standard deviation of B? You do the same thing for B to calculate standard deviation of it. As a result, it is 10 times larger than data set A because SB is 21.6. So if you compare the standard deviations here, obviously data set B has much larger variability compared to data set A. And this conclusion is consistent with what we thought before, right? Right? Before calculating SA and SB, we discussed a little bit about the variability for data set A and B, and we concluded that B should have higher variability. And see here, standard deviation proved that SB is 10 times larger than SA. So next time, when you have multiple data sets, you want to compare the variability of these data sets. Simply calculate standard deviation for each of them and compare standard deviation values to find out your conclusion on the comparison of variability between multiple data groups or data sets. Okay, okay, that's all I want to say for the first half of this lecture. I will see you in the next video. Thank you.